Unity, a game engine created for everyone. A game engine that you have used if you've ever played a game since its launch in 2005, where it quickly became not one of the most popular game engines in the world, but the most popular game engine in the world, period. Cuphead, that was made in Unity. Monument Valley, that was made in Unity. Beat Saber, Among Us, Crossy Road, Pokemon Go, Fall Guys, one of my all-time favorite games, Ori and the Blind Forest. The list is endless. Or at least it would be if it wasn't for this once democratized system seemingly out of the blue just charging its users an extortionate amount extra to use its groundbreaking software and in turn completely demolishing the company. A lot of big AAA studios like for instance Bungie don't use Unity to create their games, they have their own engines. But they are huge AAA studios creating engines that in a lot of cases take longer to create than the games themselves. Regardless, these examples are few and far between. Game development tools like Unity gave developers, big and small, the ability to subscribe to their game engine and that's exactly what they did. Massive studios like Nintendo published games like Mario Kart Tour using Unity and tiny developers like Team Cherry, mostly made up of only three people, originally made the game Hollow Knight using the same game engine. It's estimated that Mario Kart Tour alone has made Nintendo just shy of $293 million, and Hollow Knight has made closer to $30 million. And you can bet your bottom dollar that Unity has made a nice chunk of change from these titles too, thanks to their subscription-based model, but more on that in a little bit. Because as exciting as it may be to follow all the drama and watch this massive name in video games just completely die, it's important to go back to the beginning and find out what made Unity so great before the company came crumbling down. But before we get into that, let's talk about the history of this video sponsor, Pixel Starships. Now, Pixel Starships are not a stranger to the channel. Originally a Kickstarter, before becoming a hugely popular game, Pixel Starships was so well received that they asked to come back not once, but twice, hence the sponsorship. And as you guys seem to love them so much last time, I'm more than happy to help promote the next game. Launching on the 26th of September 2023, the Kickstarter for Pixel Starships 2 lets you once again Again, take control and command your very own starship in an MMO world where you'll need to take control of every single aspect of the ship. If this is your first time you've ever heard of the game, then you may be seeing similarities to the incredible FTL game. And to be fair, that's a good assessment, as it's what drew me in from the beginning too. However, in Pixel Starships and now Pixel Starships 2, you get to trade and battle to your heart's content with millions of real-life players, not only on your mobile, but your PC too. And best of all, and I know you guys like this the most too when I last mentioned it, but Pixel Starships and now the incredible looking sequel is not a pay to win game. It's just a solid MMO and thanks to the sequel, it's now offering up even more strategy and graphical flair than it was before. Well worth checking out if you're interested, the link to the Kickstarter and the original game can both be found in the description. But for now, let's carry on with the video. Welcome to 2002, May the 21st, 2002 to be more precise, and if you want to get even more nitty gritty, the time was 1.47 a.m. When on a Mac Open Graphics Language message board, Nicholas Francis asked for advice on a shader program system that he wanted to include into his new game engine that he was working on. Several hours later, he got a response from one Joachim Ante, and as the conversations grew between the two, they agreed to work together on a shader system for each of their own respective game engines. However, after a short while of working on their own separate game engines, the two felt comfortable enough to join forces and collaborate on a new collaborative game engine. This was until David Helgerson got involved, who saw potential in what the two were working on, and the trio was officially united.
Over the Edge Entertainment was what they called themselves, and the aim of the company was not to only create a cool game engine, but to also create cool games in said cool game engine, and as a result to sell the games to the gamers and the software to the game makers. Before you know it, Joachim and Nicholas ended up getting a flat together to work on this new game project, which was only down the road from David, and together the team went into the basement and created their first ever game studio. We always had big ideas, we were very focused on the fact that we were going to make a game and then license out that technology. We felt that the game was necessary to prove the tech, but to be honest, we kept on slipping past our self-imposed deadlines. The team had the know-how, but they didn't have the management skills to pay the bills. And after getting out some hefty loans and then hiring a few tech wizards to help them on their journey, they all took turns in the CEO role before David took it on himself full time. By this point, the team had worked together on a business plan that followed the footsteps of Criterion, a company that was making waves on systems like the PlayStation 2 with their game engine for hire, Renderware, as seen in titles such as Burnout and eventually a whole lot more. Unfortunately for OTEE, -E, the game that they pumped out wasn't quite as popular as Burnout. Gooball was the result of about five months work, a sort of sticky monkey ball like game where you roll a blob around a small puzzle like room in an attempt to dodge the hazards and get to the end. As basic as the game was, it was actually praised quite highly by the few journalists that covered it including Inside Mac Games. Graphically, this is one of the few truly impressive games available on the Mac right now, built to take specific advantage of all of the available features and technologies of the current Mac software and and hardware. OTEE's Unity engine, which powers Google, offers lighting and shaders and particle effects more commonly seen in top-of-the-line shooters like Doom 3. However, it doesn't carry anything near the performance penalty on lower spec machines. It isn't a groundbreaking game, it isn't the next big thing in gameplay, it's simply a superbly produced, elegantly executed and truly fun game that makes the best use of its developers' obvious creativity and imagination. 8.5 out of 10. Even though the game wasn't flying off the shelves the same way Burnout was, it gave Over the Edge Entertainment just enough money to hire a few more software developers. And it gave them just enough time to refine the software from a game maker's point of view. And it was all thanks to Google. And then on June 6, 2006, the first ever version of Unity was released to the public. Unity version 1.0.0. Of course, plenty of game engines came before Unity, but the aim for this one was to create a game maker's program that had professional tools, an easy workflow, a simple asset pipeline and a drag and drop interface inspired by Apple's Final Cut Pro product, which was an easily accessible program available to absolutely everyone that had a Mac. In those early days, this software was 100% focused just on the Mac. Only Mac game makers could make Mac games using Unity. And a lot of those game development studios were a bit reluctant to join Unity. The reason was because it was pretty common for random software houses to eventually just give it all up and stop supporting their homemade game making software when they realize that the industry is just way too cutthroat or more than likely the amount of effort needed to look after a game development program like Unity was just way too much of a mammoth task to undertake on their own. Still, Unity didn't really have these problems. Unity was different because Unity was more than your average game making software. Plus, again, it was on Mac systems exclusively. Because of this, it did soon start to build up a small but loyal indie-like following of developers that paid a small licensing fee to use the software and who often gave feedback whilst using it in the Unity forums. And those original Unity developers became so obsessed with fixing the bugs presented to them in those forums that they would hardly sleep, waking up in the middle of the night, checking the boards and instantly fixing 
the issues. It took two years of constantly updating the software, constantly checking the boards for fixes that they needed to implement, taking on small IT jobs to pay the rent, and one of them even got a job at a coffee shop, not really for the money, but for the free food because they didn't really have any money. All so they can continue working on Unity. Eventually, the time had come to release Unity 1.1. All their eggs were in this basket, they knew they had nothing going on except Unity, better known now as Unity 3D. And with this update, they had decided to move from the even more niche than it is now world of Mac gaming, and for the first time ever allowed users to export their games to Microsoft Windows computers and compatible web browsers via a plugin. It was the worst possible choice we could make from a business perspective but we were just hackers and we just liked our Macs. We weren't thinking big thoughts from a business perspective. It was the 3D angle that really caught people's attention, especially in the browser-based world of web games, as the vast majority of casual gamers up to this point didn't have a whole lot more than Flash to create their casual games. Unity 3D gave them the ability to make incredibly janky 3D games in a web browser. And even though it didn't take over from the popularity of Flash games, it really did open the eyes of many as to what Unity was compared to the competition. Now, before continuing on, it really is quite important to talk about the price of Unity back then, as I'm sure that's why you're all here in the first place. At this point in time, it was $249 for an individual or small business that had less than a $100,000 turnover. However, that was very much the cheap option. A couple of features were missing, web-based exports for instance came with a watermark and you couldn't export your projects to PC. If you wanted all that jargon added on, however, then it's going to cost you $1,499 per license, no matter how much your business earns. But the best part about all of this was that you could download Unity 100% for free. This was obviously the most stripped down version of the software, but you could use it to create games and release games for free. It was a great way to lure people in, giving them the opportunity to create their own games in a software package that anyone could use, and again, release those games for free. Of course, by this point, if you made a good enough game, then you would likely be willing to pay the license fee to upgrade it and release your product to the wider market. And the more the Unity team developed the software moving forward to make the software package more advanced, they never lost sight of the smaller developers too, making sure that not only was this this software taking advantage of newer, more powerful Macs, but also making it more than adequate for low-end users too. There's a class of hardcore geeks who will never be satisfied with something they didn't code from scratch. However, for people who just want to sit down and create games and actually finish them as well, Unity is a very solid tool to utilize. As the software progressed into 2007, we got to see Unity 2.0, and it was even more alluring now than ever with a heavy emphasis on exporting those games for Windows users. However, the big break for the company definitely came only one year later in 2008. By this point, the company had finally started to turn a profit. Software sales were paying the bills over at Unity HQ, which resulted in a few more employees for the company. And even though it was the fact that you could export your games to run on a PC that was the bulk of that interest, and therefore income for the company, it wasn't long before it all flipped around again as Steve Jobs announced this. Thanks, so, you're a developer and you've just spent two weeks or maybe a little bit longer writing this amazing app and what is your dream? Your dream is to get it in front of every iPhone user and hopefully they love it and buy it, right? That's not possible today. Developers don't, most developers don't have those kinds of resources. Even the big developers would have a hard time getting their app in front of every iPhone user. Well, we're going to solve that problem for every developer, big to small. And the way we're going to do it is what we call the App Store. This is an application we've written to deliver apps to the iPhone. And we're going to put it on every single iPhone with the next release of the software. And so our developers are going to be able to reach every 
iPhone user through the App Store. This is the way we're going to distribute apps to the iPhone. As soon as that App Store was announced, Unity got to work making sure that their software was iPhone ready. And when it was, Unity moved from being one of the big guns against players like Unreal and turned into the big gun. It happened really quickly. Suddenly, a lot of people wanted Unity. From here, Unity moved from strength to strength. Major AAA studios were using Unity, and smaller indie developers were also using the free package and eventually moving on to that paid package when the time was right. By this time, 3.0 rolled around in 2010. Unity Technologies, as they were now known, continued to grow even further by recreating the software from scratch to now run on PCs, eliminating the need for its users to go out and buy Macs to use their software, and as you you can imagine, the floodgates opened up even more. By this point, Unity had got over 200,000 registered users, easily making them the number one game development tool out there, especially considering the majority of mobile phone games were made using Unity. Flash implementation got added in 2011, which continued to widen its reach, and by 2012, the implementation of 2D graphics got added too to the software, which as you would expect, was a huge win for the mobile and indie market. The user base grew to 1.2 million registered users by this point, and you could even use the software to make Facebook games now too. Anyone want to visit my farm? <laughs> okay, I'm not actually sure Farmville was ever made using Unity. In fact, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Regardless, Unity was growing at a rapid pace, way faster than the original owners could ever have expected. Now, of course, Unreal Engine were by far the company's biggest competition, being a key player before Unity was even a thing. And because of this, Unity Technologies knew that they simply just couldn't slow down. The entire gaming landscape had changed by 2015, and with the release of Unity 5, the company that once provided cheap and even free software to game developers in the beginning compared to the overly expensive Unreal Engine 2.5, was now going head to head with its biggest competitors, not just functionally, but financially too. Because Unreal Engine was now free too. And I don't just mean a stripped down version, I'm talking about the full version, 100% for free for you to download, just as long as your game didn't bring in a gross revenue of $1 million. And I'm sorry to say to all you kiddies out there that wanna make video games, very few games hit that mark. If you did hit $1 million, however, of gross revenue, and just to clarify, that's not profit to you after you've paid your taxes and expenses or whatever, it's just gross profit, only then will you need to pay Unreal any money. So for example, if you sold 40,000 copies of your $25 game, that will equate to exactly $1 million. If you reach this goal, then you need to pay Unreal 5%, which would be $50,000, leaving you with $950,000, of which you need to take out your taxes, your expenses, your Steam fees, yada, yada, yada. And by this point, and for a good long while in fact, Unity had no choice but to follow in their footsteps with a similar price model. Download it for free, get the majority of what it has to offer and even release games for free. However, what makes it less appealing on the surface is that if you want all of the extra features, then it's going to run you a subscription fee of $399 a year or $75 a month, just as long as you make less than $200,000 a year. If your game is making more than that, then that monthly fee or yearly fee goes up by quite a bit, and just like I'm Unreal, you gotta be paying a fee. Now on the surface, Unreal seems like the better option, right? No subscription fees, you've got a much more higher threshold to hit before you start paying them any money. But for non-game developers out there, the best way I can describe it and the best way I understand it is it's like buying a console. You don't buy a console just based on its specs, you buy the console that is best suited to you. Most professional YouTubers edit in Adobe. 
but I prefer to use Magic Vegas. It's just what I prefer to use. At the end of the day, both options provide a free service. They make sure that anyone has the ability to make games and they only charge the big companies when they make successful games. As a game dev, you want the same opportunities that the big guys have and you want to make loads of money too. Thankfully, software packages like Unity and Unreal provide everyone with that opportunity. Or do they? You see, just before Unity 5.0 in 2015, EA's ex-CEO John Riccatello joined Unity Technologies as their new CEO. Under his wing and at the height of Unity's life, he managed to get even more mobile phone developers on board, resulting in Unity taking over 70% of the entire mobile gaming market. And this helped the company hold that title of most popular, or at least the most commonly used game making software, with its now one 1.5 million monthly users. Now this all may sound great, right? Sure. But the problem with John Riccatello is that he is a successful businessman. But not because he puts the customer first, organically growing a well-respected company that has a flurry of users that feel like they're part of the product and therefore are happy to go along for the ride with its growth and in turn are rewarded for their loyalty. Nope. He's the kind of businessman that's successful because he's a scumbag. Under his wing at EA, he was the guy that heavily imposed microtransactions, forcing you, the player, to have to play to do even the most basic of things. It's easy to forget, but after Zynga really brought home this microtransaction-filled free-to-play games, EA soon followed suit, but with full-priced, premium-priced games just like FIFA 09, changing the concept of free to play to pay to win, to pay twice to win. And even though that's not all down to old Johnny here, I mean, they didn't win worst company in the world for nothing, did they? Well, actually, two corrections there. They got that award not only for their DLC mindset, but also for their absolute obsession of buying up small companies that they see as competition and doing nothing with them. Also, they won that award twice, by the way. And they won those awards under the banner of John. The guy who was in charge when forcing single-player gamers to pay for weapon upgrades in Dead Space 3. And the guy who was in charge when Sims 3 and SimCity both had some of the worst launches in video game history. In fact, the latter was so bad that Johnny Boy ended up quitting EA only a couple of weeks later. Although I'm sure those two events had nothing to do with each other. Oh, and here's a voice clip from John himself when talking about Battlefield at a stockholders meeting. When you are six hours into playing Battlefield and you run out of ammo in your clip and we ask you for a dollar to reload, you're really not very price sensitive at that point in time. Um, but it is a, it's a great model, and I think it represents a, a substantially better future for the industry. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That guy is now in charge over at Unity. The same guy that just said that if you're willing to play a game for six hours, then you're probably willing to pay a dollar to just simply refill your gun. This isn't even pay twice to win anymore. This is pay endlessly to simply just play the game. It's the perfect example of someone that isn't interested in creating great games, but instead it's someone that just wants to make money over anything else. And don't you worry, that same mindset mindset is now at Unity 2. In a now infamous interview with PocketGamer.biz, when asked about his opinion on the backlash that implementing monetization early on in the game making process has been received, he responded with the following. Ferrari and some other high-end car manufacturers still use clay and carving knives. It's a very small portion of the game industry that works that way. And some of these people are my favorite people in the world to fight with. They're the most beautiful and pure, brilliant people. They're also some of the biggest idiots. If you ask me, this tells us everything we need to know about John. And honestly, tell me down in the comments if I'm reading into this incorrectly. But what John is saying is that he admires game developers. Actually, I think I'm being a bit too kind there. He loves to fight with game developers because what he doesn't love is said game developers putting the game before the monetization. In fact, people that do so are 
effing idiots. In other words, in his ideal world, when game developers get together and think up a brand new game concept, they don't think to themselves, oh, we should make a triple jump type game and base the game around that mechanic. Instead, what they should be thinking is, you know what we should do? Charge people for this triple jump feature. Heck, we can even charge people again for a quadruple jump feature, a quintuple jump feature, a sextuple jump feature, a septuple jump feature, and an octuple jump feature. It's an ideology that he pushed heavily back in his EA days, and it's because of that ideology that a lot of people out there didn't play what are actually some rather brilliant games because he left such a bad taste in gamers' mouths. At least he only was in charge of EA games, so gamers could go and find other games elsewhere, right? Exactly. Sadly, now he's in charge of the software that builds the games under the umbrella of game developers, big and small. And even though you may think that doesn't really matter as, well, you know, he's not in charge of the game making process himself. On the 12th of September, 2023, he changed the pricing scheme of Unity, arguably the most popular game making software package in the world. And that change wasn't just gonna affect the average game dev, but the entire game industry as a whole. On top of putting the price up to the subscription service of Unity, which as bad as it was and definitely would have stung the Unity game makers out there for the average game player, you probably would have never heard that this happened. Unity also stated that from the 1st of January 2023, they were going to charge developers a small 20 cent fee every single time a game is installed that was built using Unity. Hmm. Confusing, isn't it? Right, let's just get our heads around this, shall we? Let's say you're a game developer and the game you've just made is Fall Guys. Fall Guys is an incredibly popular game that works on practically every system out there and our family are big fans of Fall Guys. I have two kids and they each have a Nintendo Switch, totaling three Nintendo Switches in our household. I've got a PlayStation 5 and two Xbox Ones. And yes, as crazy as it may sound, Fall Guys is downloaded onto every single system. In fact, I think I may have even downloaded it on my old PlayStation 4 too. We like Fall Guys in our family. It's a good family game that we can all just join in and play on our own individual systems together at the same time. And from time to time, we do that very thing. Now, if you're the game developer of Fall Guys that was created in Unity, then you would have to pay Unity 20 cents every time someone installed it. We installed it seven times, so you would have to pay Unity $1.40. Before this price hike, I have personally paid about 10 or 20 pounds in microtransactions at most, getting the odd skin for the kids that don't really change up the gameplay in any way, and I'm sure the company was fine with this arrangement. We're not obsessive players by any means, it's just a fun little family pastime. But now imagine that company from the 1st of January. All of a sudden, they've got to pay tens of hundreds of thousands definitely millions actually millions of dollars to unity because their install base is over 50 million people and by the way that 50 million number that is incredibly old information if this this game has definitely been downloaded way more than that the answer is obvious isn't it if they want to continue to stay afloat they're gonna have to change the game engine which is an incredibly hard thing to do or they're just gonna have to go down the john riccatello route of choosing monetization before their gameplay is it really that crazy of a scenario in a game like fall guys where now you're gonna have to start waiting an hour in between turns or you're gonna have to pay a small fee or watch an advert just to continue playing the game i mean it already happens with games like candy crush doesn't it or worse still is it really gonna be that crazy to imagine a scenario where paid for enhancements like reloading your gun in battlefield becomes a standard when the company desperately needs to pay back unity this new expense that had been shockingly slapped right in front of them well if john and every other suit out there that chooses money over actual good gaming experiences would have it then yes this is definitely the way to go moving forward and obviously i've used an extreme example there with full guys but it's just an example to show you if it's going to affect a massive company like that imagine how devastating this will be for small indie devs too 
Games that you had to pay for once on Steam, but you keep coming back to with every reinstall of Windows. This new pricing scheme has the ability to completely bankrupt companies that made them unless they add pay to play elements into the games that you loved. If this goes ahead, expect to find your favorite old Unity games just get delisted from the platform. Why would a studio continue to pay through the teeth for really old games? Everything about this is absolutely terrible and it's completely destroyed one of the biggest names in all of gaming, even if you've never heard of them. It affects absolutely everyone and it's mind boggling that it ever got approved. In fact, the update that told us all this was so heavily rushed or so it seems that people are not actually sure if the dev is going to be the one that's charged 20 cents per install fee or if the platform providing the game, aka Microsoft, Nintendo, Steam, etc. They're the ones that are going to have to pay the 20 cent fee. <laughs> Why are they even involved? That's like me making a video, uploading it onto YouTube and then every time you watch a video, YouTube has now got to pay Magix, that's the company that make the software I use to make my videos, 20 cents. They're never going to pay it and I would just have to shut down my channel because it would cost me millions of pounds, which I can promise you, us YouTubers definitely do not make. They are obviously never going to pay it. They never signed a contract. None of this makes sense. It just goes to show that in the front of that, should we really be doing this mindset? was money. Money is the most important thing and sure, without it, you don't have a game engine to start with. But this was a game engine originally built up with the user in mind, a collaborative effort that gave just as much as it took back. And they built a successful business off the back of that mindset. I mean, it's called Unity for fuck's sake. It's created by game lovers for game lovers until the money lovers come along, completely destroyed the company because they put their money loving in front of people that actually like to play great games. As of the scripting of this episode, Unity have half-heartedly updated the pricing updates page on their website with the following. We have heard you. We apologize for the confusion and angst the runtime fee policy was announced on Tuesday caused. We are listening, talking to our team members, community, customers and partners and will be making changes to the policy. We will share an update in a couple of days. Thank you for your honest and critical feedback. But the damage is already done. Even if nothing ends up changing, developers are looking to move to other game making platforms. Nobody trusts Unity anymore. It's got so, so bad that even if John Riccatello ends up stepping down or better yet gets removed from his position, they will still be a million miles away from repairing the damage that he has personally caused. Hey there guys, DJ Slope from the future here. Now obviously I've just created that video and already so much has changed. So I've got a little something here to add at the end. Uh, basically since I've created this video, a staggering number of developers have moved from Unity or in the process of moving from Unity and instead have taken advantage of other game making packages such as Godot, Game Maker and of course Unreal. To make this easier for developers, the company AppLovin created a tool to help users move their code from C Sharp to C++ quickly and efficiently. It is believed that because of this and the heavy amount of backlash from the community, Unity had no choice but to rewind their pay per install pricing model and are now providing a service that is arguably more attractive financially even than Unreal. Is it enough though? Personally, I don't think so. The best thing to come from this is that Unity are no longer going to hurt the developers of the games that have already been released using Unity. As for the games that are on their way, which are being built in Unity, well, fingers crossed that Unity stay true to their word. Regardless, for many it doesn't matter, an incredible amount of interest has been raised towards the competition because of what Unity themselves have done. The story is ever unfolding, even whilst creating this video, new developments were popping up, and even though I I do appreciate the effort that Unity have gone to to correct the error of their ways. It's hard to imagine a future where Unity remain as one of the big players. And sadly, they've only got their self to blame. 
And there you have it, guys. That is the rise and fall of Unity. Uh, this is the part of the video where I'd like to give a massive shout out to all of my Patreons and YouTube members. They're the names that you're seeing at the bottom of the screen. Uh, with an extra big shout out going to the following Akatimo84, Andrew Dalton, Arista, Benjamin Guy, Boots and Pup, Bram Perez, Casey Samples, Jeff Matic, Clan Bod, Conrad Constantine, De Action Saxon, Dina, Dina81, Derekuda, Ian Quell, James Manchild, Jabba Al Aiden, James, Jeff Mianowski, uh, John Rogers, Cat Layton, Matt Jackson, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nicholas Burtner, Alva Giles Zane, Paul Float, Roll VP, Richard Aldridge, Ryan Burford, Sir Nielsen, Shade Silent, Shadow Dragon, Stephen, That Gamer, The Sneaky Ferret, Vitas Varnes, VPS Data, Vike Echo, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Hand Burglar. Thank you to all of you people for your awesome support. Really, really do appreciate it. And if anyone out there is watching and want to become a member of a pay, uh, become a Patreon or a YouTube member, the links are down below. But honestly, just giving the video a like, a thumbs up, a comment, sharing it on social medias, Reddit, all that sort of stuff, is the biggest help you can possibly do. And of course, please do go and support Pixel Starships too. The link's down below, and you'll also see that on the title card coming up. Really appreciate you guys for your support as well. So much love, guys. Until next time, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.